Dr. Silva, and I'm here to talk to you about ProVigil, Modafinil, and New Vigil, or Modafinil. And so I'm just going to talk about Modafinil, and everything I say applies to our Modafinil, and then we'll get to our Modafinil toward the end here. What is ProVigil? ProVigil is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Simply put, it is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor, and we've heard of this, we're familiar with this with some of the other agents. For example, Wellbutrin also inhibits the reuptake of dopamine as well as norepinephrine. And it's considered a wakefulness promoting agent, i.e. a non-stimulant. Now I'm going to tell you, it is considered a non-stimulant officially, technically, and this may be semantics, but actually, no, it's not just semantics. New Vigil, ProVigil, they are stimulants, folks. They're stimulants, okay? I've taken them. They're stimulants. They give you all the effects that stimulants give you. They wake you up. They dry out your mouth. They make you talk more. They make you focus better. They're used off-label for ADHD. And they can be abused. They're Schedule Four substances. You have to watch people with chemical dependency closely when you give them this medication. It's not the same abuse potential as amphetamine, but absolutely patients can abuse them. And they're Schedule Four. There are five schedules of controlled substances. These are Schedule Four. The lower you go, the less controlled it is. So it's not as high as the Schedule Two amphetamines. But to say it's not a stimulant, well, butrin, which also blocks the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine. It's definitely not a stimulant, okay? Even though it shares chemical structure with the amphetamines, well, butrin doesn't get you high. Yeah, it dries out your mouth, it wakes you up and causes insomnia, it can make you irritable, make you talk more. Definitely also has stimulating, activating properties, and we use it when we need that in depression and other states. And yeah, it's kind of okay for helping with attention and concentration, especially in people who are depressed. But people who have ADD, maybe not so much. But fine, no argument for me that bupropion is not a stimulant. But provisional is a stimulant, okay, in my book. So anyway, that's just my take on it. What is special about provisional? Well, it increases neuronal activity in a very specific part of the brain, the hypothalamus, and specifically the hypothalamic wakefulness center, the tuberal mammillary nucleus, the TMN. And the TMN, tuberal mammillary, tuber, tuberal mammillary nucleus, not just the hypothalamus, but the hypothalamic wakefulness center, which is the tuberal mammillary nucleus. Tuberal mammillary, say that 10 times fast. TMN. And that is the hypothalamic sleep wake switch. It also activates the tuberal mammillary nucleus neurons that release histamine. And we knew that antihistamines caused sedation, and so there was speculation that prohistaminergic agents might be wakeful promoting agents, and indeed they were. And also what we've come to find out is that histamine is also one of the so-called smart neurotransmitters, like dopamine, that it actually enhances cognition as well as wakefulness. And so beyond just attention and concentration even, it enhances cognition. It is used off-label for ADD because it increases attention and concentration, which are two cognitive parameters. But it also makes you smarter to have prohistaminergic agent. It also activates hypothalamic neurons that secrete orexin, also known as hypocretin. This is a neuropeptide hormone. It's got two names because in 1998, it was discovered almost simultaneously by two independent groups of researchers. One of them named it orexin, which is the Greek word for appetite, because it stimulates the appetite. It also drives feeding behavior. And so orexin, you know, anorexia, anorexia, no orexin, you don't have any appetite. But so orexin is important for promoting feeding behavior. The other thing that's interesting more to do with the wakefulness promoting aspects of orexin or hypocretin is that destruction of the cells that produce orexin causes type 1 narcolepsy. Narcolepsy, as most people know, is where you have excessive daytime sleepiness, and you can have sleep attacks, and there are other symptoms as well, cataplexy and hypnagogic, hypnopompic hallucinations. There's a triad, actually a tetrad, but the type 1 narcolepsy is caused when these cells are destroyed, and so you're no longer producing orexin. And it's interesting, it's the immune system attacks the cells and kills them. So it's an autoimmune condition 
but it's because of one's genes. And so the genetic code causes this autoimmune condition. It's very similar to type 1 diabetes, where the beta cells in the Isle of Langerhans and the pancreas are destroyed, either by an autoimmune process or maybe by a viral process. So it stands to figure that this medication is good for narcolepsy. And in fact, it is FDA approved for narcolepsy. It's also FDA approved for shift work sleep disorder. That's if you're a nurse who works 12 hour shifts, but you go from days to nights and back to days and back and forth and back and forth. And so your circadian rhythm is constantly having to adjust and you're having insomnia and fatigue because of it. And so there's actually a condition that we've identified and other shift workers that have that problem. It's not approved, FDA approved for jet lag, which is a very similar desynchrony of the circadian rhythm, but it does work. And also it's FDA approved for sleep apnea, hypopnea syndrome which is excessive daytime sleepiness, which is due to numerous apneic episodes throughout the night where a person stops breathing, and there's different reasons for that. A lot of times it's associated with being obese, Pickwickian syndrome. A person often snores, and they stop breathing throughout the night, and it disrupts their sleep. They don't have the deep stages that they need, and they're super tired the next day. It's really important to note that you treat the underlying cause of the airway obstruction when it's obstructive sleep apnea. You treat the cause of the underlying obstruction, whatever you have to do there, and usually it's CPAP machines, continuous positive airway pressure machines that keep those airways open for whatever reason that they're closed, whether it's COPD that's causing the closing or whether it's uh, obesity that's causing the closing of the airways during sleep. You treat that, and then you use modafinil or R modafinil to help with the sleepiness. You add it to, it's adjunctive in the context of sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome. Off-label, it's used to treat sleepiness and fatigue in a variety of conditions, including depression, in which case it can also improve cognition. And the promoting wakefulness seems to be independent of any effect that these medications, these pseudo-stimulants, I call them alternative stimulants, any effect that they might have on the mood, because they can cause euphoria, and that's why they can be abused, that's why I think they're controlled substances, but independent of that, it can improve sleepiness and fatigue and depression. It also is good in conditions like multiple sclerosis or end-stage conditions where you're using opioid analgesias, for example, end-stage cancer patients that can't stay awake because they're on so much morphine for their pain. And so it can be very useful to add it so that they can stay awake and have those final moments with their family members. It is also used off label to treat circadian desynchrony time zone change syndrome, or otherwise known as jet lag, that is alternating fatigue and insomnia, which is due to the fact that the body's natural circadian rhythms are out of sync with the external environment due to rapid travel across multiple time zones. And the further you go, the worse it is. It can last for days. My sister just got back from Singapore, which is on the other side of the planet, and she is still having trouble a week out. So. Importantly, modafinil is not a replacement for sleep. The treatment for sleep deprivation is sleep. So where it does work, if you take it at the beginning of your shift to wake you up, if you're falling asleep because of shift work sleep, desynchrony of your circadian rhythm, or if you just got off a plane from Singapore, it works, it will wake you up, and for a few hours it will even help you focus. But you have to get your rest and you have to get back in sync. The other interesting thing about ProVigil is that it can be a one-size-fits-all medication. Now, of course, no medication is one-size-fits-all when it comes to dosing, but ProVigil comes pretty close. You can start it at 200 milligrams. I wouldn't because of nausea and headaches. I would start at 100. They even make a 100 milligram tablet, so there's no reason to go whole hog. You can always increase the dosage in a few days, but a lot of Patients do great on 200 milligrams a day, and they don't have to increase the dosage or repeat taking a dose in order to get good relief 
from their fatigue. And a lot of people don't feel stimulated or jittery as they would with a stimulant. They just feel awake. And that's very nice. And then when they want to go to sleep, they typically can. So insomnia is a possible side effect, certainly if you take it right before bedtime. But people who take Provigil and Individual, they don't complain of that. In fact, they note that they don't have trouble falling asleep when they want to. As far as titrating the dosage, Sometimes for sleepiness, you do have to increase and you can go on up to six and 800 milligrams. But for fatigue and for problems concentrating, less may actually be more. Some patients actually do paradoxically better on 50 to 200 milligrams a day. And so you may try that in a patient, particularly that is feeling fatigue and or problems concentrating, lowering the dosage may actually help them to do better. But the dose can also creep up because Provigil induces its own metabolism. Its presence causes the body to produce more enzymes that metabolize it, and so it induces its own metabolism. That's called autoinduction. And the more you take and the longer you take it, the more it does that. So a lot of times, uh, patients will lose efficacy and they will have to take increasing doses in order to get the same efficacy. It's not the same as when a patient takes Adderall and they're chasing the euphoria and they're saying, oh, it's not working anymore because it's not, it doesn't feel the way it did when I first started taking it. I did another video on that. That's very common that the dose of stimulants, including methylphenidate, Ritalin, Ritalin and Adderall, the amphetamines and the methylphenidate preparations because people are actually confused about what the therapeutic effect is or they are taking the medication recreationally and they want that euphoria so they're chasing a side effect. But this is different. With modafinil there's a ceiling effect of what I've noticed and this is why I think there's less abuse potential because the more Adderall you take, the more amphetamine you take, you take more and more, you feel better and better and you, you get that effect that you had before and you certainly can go too far and not feel so great and not do so great with too much amphetamine. But with modafinil, you get to a point where you can take more and you don't get any more effect. You're not any more awake and you're not any more motivated and whatever euphoria you may have experienced that you may be trying to replicate, you don't get it by redosing. A lot of people do have to redose. It's not uncommon to take 200 milligrams twice a day. Or take 200 milligrams in the morning, take another 100 milligrams in the afternoon. And one of the advantages of armodafinil is once daily dosing. I will get to that in a bit. Side effects. Headache is probably the most common. It is dose dependent, which is why it's a good idea to start slow and build up over time and also to take it with food. It does have stimulant properties, so it causes all the same symptoms that stimulants can cause, as I've already said. But this includes anxiety dry mouth, anorexia, and it can increase your pulse, and it can increase your blood pressure. It can lead to palpitations, but jitteriness is uncommon. That would probably be an indication of the dose is too high. And it can cause insomnia, again in theory, but this is not at all common. Severe hypertension is a contraindication to taking these medications, as are arrhythmias, as they rarely can cause those as well. There's an important drug-drug interaction. These medications can decrease the circulating levels of estradiol. And so oral contraceptives that contain estradiol can be less effective. Very important to warn your women of childbearing age. And this can persist for as long as a month after the patient stops taking the medication. Although Provigil has not been proven to be teratogenic, it's not recommended in pregnancy. It's metabolized by the liver, it's excreted by the kidneys, and it's well tolerated. There have been no fatalities reported in overdose. What about armodafinil? What's armodafinil? Armodafinil is the enantiomer of the racemic mixture. And so let me give you a little bit of organic chemistry. I talk about this also in the Selexa versus Lexapro video. But just in a nutshell here, when you have an organic molecule, a carbon-based molecule, there is such thing as stereochemistry. And that is the phenomenon in which the mirror image of the molecule is not the same as the molecule itself. 
This is not always the case. A lot of times the mirror image of a molecule, even if it contains carbon in its center, is the same. You can take that mirror image and you can superimpose it. You can turn it around in three-dimensional space in, in nature and you say, oh, it's, it's the same molecule. It's exactly the same molecule. Sometimes, depending on the moieties that are attached, sometimes that mirror image is non-superimposable. If you take it, there's no way that you can twist it and turn it such that it's the same molecule. It's actually a different molecule and it's called enantiomers. They're enantiomers of one another. And what the significance of that is, is that they interact with other physical structures, including receptors, which are usually proteins, and other the enzymes, for example, in the body, which are also proteins. It makes a difference in biochemistry. These molecules are right and left. And what makes them right and left is if you shine a beam of polarized light and you aim it at the molecule, the right-handed molecule will deflect that beam of light. It will rotate it to the right. It's dextro-rotatory. If you aim a beam of polarized light at a left-handed molecule, you'll have a levorotatory action. It will rotate that beam of polarized light to the left. And that's how you can tell the difference. A racemic mixture is where you have both right and left. And so provigil, modafinil, is the racemic mixture of modafinil. But R modafinil contains only the R, the right-handed molecule, R for rectus. So what's the difference between R modafinil and modafinil? Everything I've said so far also applies to R modafinil. The pharmacodynamics are identical. The difference is in the pharmacokinetics. The pharmacokinetics is a measure of how the body absorbs and metabolizes and excretes these medications. And so R modafinil has a, a longer duration of action. It takes the body longer to metabolize it away and to excrete it. And so the duration of action is longer, and so a, a single daily dose is almost always sufficient. And so it's a little more convenient to dose. So the advantages of modafinil and R modafinil, it stimulates selective regions of the brain involved in the sleep-wake cycle, and this leads to less activation and less abuse potential than traditional stimulants. Traditional stimulants. I consider them untraditional stimulants, atypical stimulants, alternative stimulants. Whatever word you want to put on it, but don't tell me they're not stimulants. They are stimulants.